Hi, everybody. For all you who are very dressed up, I'm sorry if your shoes are getting ruined. I take no responsibility for God watering the earth. Um, my name is Father Zimbila. For all you that uh, came after Mass, I won't hold it against you. Uh, just joking. I know a lot of people have traveling problems. Um, one of the things that this, this is beautiful, there's a lot of people here. By the way, typical Catholics, there are four rows in the front row here that uh, somebody can sit down. Uh, so, um, This is a very dangerous proposition. Whoever set this up did not do a good job for the speaker because the speaker is facing the dead and you guys are all facing the water, which is the better view. So enjoy the view here tonight. We're very blessed to have that. Um, a secondary point to in the homily is, you know, my decision to uh, not respond to my supervisor's request to lie to that person is that, as I mentioned, I didn't know who this gentleman was, but it made me recognize that we have to value one another in the workplace, that if we know one another or we don't. And you know, Jesus always tells us that we have to love our neighbor, love our enemies. He doesn't necessarily say we have to like each other. In the sense that we all have different personalities. And so sometimes personalities are just going to clash because of our person that dominant or passive or task-oriented type of personality. That's, that's God made us to be unique in that respect. But one of the challenges that we have, even within parish ministry, is helping one another respect who we are and the value, the dignity we are as a person. So as a, a group of young professionals, um, thank you for being here and for your witness to, to the faith, uh, to our Lord. And then hopefully just trust that Holy Spirit to help move you in the workplace so that you are always um, valuing one another even if we're not necessarily crazy about one another, okay? So thanks again, welcome to St. Paul. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the priest is supposed to hear confessions now, um, so I guess that's what I'll be doing, but I'm um, just joking. So I, under the carriage, um, it's called the carriage because that's what the horses used to come in um, right before you were even born. Uh, but anyways, it is the carriage, and that's what the horses would come through and drop the people off at the house. Uh, so that's the rectory right there, and the porch, there's a side porch there, not the front porch, the side porch. Um, I'll be over there if anybody wants to go to confession. And if you are um, in line, um, just stay on the other side of, of the carriage porch so that there's privacy for uh, speaking, okay? Thank you very much again for coming. I really appreciate it. All right, thank you, Father Jim. Um, just another... Uh, housekeeping item. If you need to use the restroom, they'll be in the same uh, lobby area as you went into the common area, uh, right around the corner of the church if anyone needs to do that during the talk. Um, so thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, tonight we have someone uh, joining us who spent his career um, actually in, in the financial audit field, uh, which is very interesting. So Dan Torpy, he knows what it's like to be with clients on a daily basis that maybe don't share uh, his same values, most notably when it comes time to audit him or audit them. Um, so, a dedicated Catholic man, Dan and his family attend St. Monica Parish. He's also part of the National Board for the Young Catholic Professionals and is heavily involved with the U.S. Um, Olympic Weightlifting Organization. Um, so, please join me in welcoming Mr. Dan Torby. I think I'm, uh, I think I'm mic'd up here. How is this? I'm going to have the people. I need to be in the middle. Um, I just came back from a pilgrimage. I was in Medjugorje, and I landed Sunday night, 28 hours of traveling. But I met Trey and Nicholas in a pilgrimage last year before um, COVID hit, I think in February. We were opening up uh, the Louisville chapter of YCP, and we did a pilgrimage in Kentucky to the uh, Abbey of Gethsemane, where Thomas Merton was at. We visited other places in Kentucky, I think two or three distilleries. So it was a very spirited pilgrimage. <laughs> So of course, that's when Nicholas recruited me, like, come on, you gotta speak, and well, here I am. So I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna give you three stories, and it's really my progression on how I look to find value in others in the workplace, how I look to find God in others, and it's really been a progression for me in my career and in my life. <clears throat> One's gonna be about a person I work with, actually on projects here uh, in Detroit for a couple of years, 
So I'll talk about that. The other is really working on the art of listening and having, having a mechanism to be a better listener. And then finally, I'm going to talk about forgiveness. And those three things, themes, will make up my talk. And then if we want to have time for Q&A, we'll do that. So uh, just a little bit about me. Um, not from Texas. This is actually a New York accent, born and raised in Queens, New York City. And one of six kids, my, I'm second generation Irish American, so all my grandparents came over from Ireland. And um, like all Irish people, I met my wife in a bar. Actually, Fourth of July weekends, our anniversary is coming up. We ultimately moved to Dallas, and we have four children, ages 22, 20, 20, and 18. Yes, I know their names. Sean, Bridget, Brendan, and Mary Kate. And uh, I'm an accountant. I do investigations. But enough about me. Let's get into the story of why we're here. So I call this story The Ties That Bind. Leonardo da Vinci. That's right, Leonardo da Vinci, you know, the famous uh, Renaissance artist that, you know, painted the Mona Lisa, stood at a wall perplexed. Didn't know how he was going to get all 12 apostles into a painting that he was commissioned at the age of 40. And it was over a dining hall, and he wanted to have a realistic point of view of people sitting in the dining room that they would look up and see all 12 apostles and our Lord, and he didn't know how to do it. And a person turned to me and said, Dan, do you know who helped Leonardo da Vinci paint this painting and figure this out? I don't know. I was in Milan on business in the early 2000s, and we took some time off and we saw some of the sites. <clears throat> he said he was Leonardo's mentor. And I don't mean like a mentor that you may have at work where you have counselors and mentors and they kind of check the box for your reviews. This was a teacher, someone who guided him. And I recently read an article about mentors where it illustrated a mentor is sort of like the double helix strand of the DNA strand where the protege and the mentor relationship are tied. And that's how Leonardo and this person were tied together. He told me this person was an accountant. An accountant? Really? Who is this person? The person who helped Leonardo da Vinci's name is Luco Puccioli. Luco Puccioli was a mathematician. He was an accountant. He's an advisor to popes. He's also a Franciscan friar. But he's also best known as the father of accounting. He wrote a text in 1490 that summarized all the knowledge of the double entry accounting system, footnotes, and my client said to me, Dan, that's still in use today. The work that you do today in the 2000s all dates back to the same principles of Luco Puccioli. And I'm like, okay, did Luco Puccioli teach Leonardo da Vinci accounting? What's, what's going on with this story? He said, no, he taught him what's called perspective. He taught him the mathematics of the 3D in a painting of what's called the vanishing point when two parallel lines go in the back, hit a perpendicular line to give depth. And I thought, how cool would it be if my mentor was Luca Puccioli as an accountant? And then I started thinking, I had a good mentor myself, you know, growing up in the profession. My mentor was a five foot five, small framed Jewish man, former insurance executive and engineer named Les Lowenstein. He wasn't a Franciscan friar or an accountant. <clears throat> but I worked with Les, he was probably 30 years my senior, and, and I met him in my late 20s. And I didn't even realize working with him the first year or so how great of a mentor he was until I started thinking about all the bad bosses I had all the bad mentors I had, like AJ. AJ, you go into a meeting with AJ, you need like three or four copies of papers and statements and schedules to meet with AJ. He, all his meetings went over time. He was never prepared, and it was awful. You'd be smoking. That's when you could smoke in offices back then. It was a mess. Or Bob, working for Bob. Everyone wanted to work for Bob. Bob had the best jobs. One problem, Bob was an alcoholic. And when you made a mistake, Bob didn't attack the mistake. He would attack you individually. Very hard working for Bob. Or Peter. I enjoyed working with Peter. Peter was very good, very nice, very intelligent. 
but he's always looking at his watch, trying to time how quickly you could do things. And he really didn't have you think he would set up schedules and just have you input numbers. So it was like a race. You'd be like inputting stuff in your computer. You'd be looking at his watch. You wouldn't really learn. Or Suzanne. No one liked working with Suzanne. She was tough. I enjoyed like, working with Suzanne. She was thorough, always prepared, very efficient. But she was kind of cold. She never really asked me about myself or what I wanted to do. But Les was different. Les was always prepared for meetings. Right? He taught me about the meeting before the meeting in business. That's where things get done. And Les was different. He really didn't hone in on the person if he made a mistake. He focused on the issue. But also not just the issue, but how would our findings impact our clients? What would their reaction be? Les wasn't focused on the efficiency of a meeting. He was focused on the effectiveness of the discussion. And Les didn't tell me what to do. He would guide me through the Socratic method of asking questions. But the biggest thing Les did for me was that he informed me as to who I was and what my skills were. Because I was 30, 31 or so, not sure what I want to do in my career. And Les would affirm my skills. He said to me, Dan, you can be a partner here. You can build this group. People enjoy working with you. You provide a vision to them. People, you motivate people because you're honest. And when you make mistakes, you tell people you make mistakes. You tell pe the clients you make mistakes. And they're attracted to that. You also give work to people based on their skills, not just pushing work out to them, but challenge them at times. And Les helped me understand what affirmation was. I'm one of six kids. I had great parents, but I was never the best ball player, never the top student, not the best band member. And my parents were busy. I don't think I was really affirmed by my parents. But Les taught me what affirmation was to find the virtues and skills that someone has and tell them that they have it. And that doesn't always happen in the workplace. That empowered me to then replicate that and do that with other people I work with. Ultimately, I became partner. I built the practice with multiple partners and actually wrote a book on insurance whose forward is by the director of risk management from Ford Motor Company. And I wrote an article on leadership, which one day was picked up by a professor in Cornell. And he invited me to speak, the dean of economics, to their program on leadership. And the same day I got the call was the same day I found out that Les had passed away at age 74. He had Crohn's disease, never really spoke about it, and he had passed away. When I gave that talk, I honored Les, and afterwards there was a Q&A, and the dean came up to me and said, Dan, thank you for giving the talk. You confirmed for us our belief that leaders aren't born, leaders are formed. And I'm sure Les would be proud of you with what you've accomplished here. And so, that's part of my message, is that leaders are formed, and make sure you get a mentor or mentor someone else to have that communication. And I've had other mentors and other people to inspire me. One thing that inspires me is art. Another one of my favorite uh, paintings is another Renaissance artist called The Calling of St. Matthew. Has anyone ever seen that painting by Caravaggio? The Calling of St. Matthew, Jesus has his arms spread out into like, looks like a, uh, <clears throat> a bar, tavern. And St. Matthew's sitting there with the coins. Matthew is the tax collector. And there's people at the table. Someone's trying to steal the coins. Someone's trying to tug at his jacket. No one is looking at our Lord except Matthew. And Caravaggio was great with using the dark and the light. And the light's just shining from Jesus pointing at you at St. Matthew. And St. Matthew in the painting is me. But he's not only saying, do you want me? He's standing up from his chair. He's getting up from his chair, answering the call. And so that painting isn't just for us accountants. That inspiration is really for all of you. All of you are here for a reason. You're being called for a reason. In my progression on you know, looking to see value of others, you say, OK, Dan, but how do I do it? One of the things I realized I had to work on was my listening skills. I realized that a couple of years ago when I was in a conversation with someone and they essentially said, 
you're not listening to me. And I said, yeah, I'm listening to you. And they said, this is what you look like. You're not really listening to me. I'm like, well, I am. I'm also texting. We can do that now. We have multi-purpose. <laughs> then they asked me, well, where am I going? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. That person was my wife. <laughs> and so I had to double down on my listening skills. I did find a mnemonic to help me with my listening skills called ORs, open-ended questions, affirming others, but affirming others using the virtues. When someone's talking, look to find what virtue, are they struggling with something you can talk about, or are they doing something you can confirm in terms of a virtue? Reflect, reflect their language that they're using, their body language. Now we have digital body language, right? Are you responding in a text the same way someone's responding? Should you even be texting that person? <laughs> or maybe pick up the phone. So now digital body language is out there to be aware of that. Um, so I suggest everyone, I mean, everyone thinks they're a good listener. I always thought I was a good listener until I had this example. And finally, one last uh, parting story, and that's I just returned from Medjugorje. Medjugorje, I didn't even tell people I was going to Medjugorje because like, what's Medjugorje? Well, it's in Yugoslavia. Well, Yugoslavia really doesn't exist anymore. It's in Bosnia Herzegovina. What? A war zone? Medjugorje has been a Marian apparition for, I think, 40 years. They celebrated the 40th anniversary this past weekend. I've never been there before. Went there with my family. And they've been closed down for a year and a half because of COVID. This past weekend, there were 40 or 50,000 people out on a lawn, bigger than this, attending mass, they had benediction, Eucharistic adoration. They had benediction, they were singing in eight different languages. They had confessions, lines for confession, and I think about 12 different languages. I think I saw three police officers the whole weekend. And I think about the world that we live in in the last 18 months, the riots, the cancel culture, and I realized there's something special going on in Medjugorje. And we heard a lot of talks from people that were moved and miracles. And they're an overriding theme of forgiveness. You need to forgive, you need to go to confession, you need to pray, you need to fast. I kept on talking about fasting. My fasting app was going off as someone was giving a talk about fasting. I'm like, I haven't fasted since Lent. So that's one thing I need to work on. But there was an overriding theme. And my daughter, my 18-year-old daughter and I, we were taking notes at one of these talks. And I'm looking at her, I'm like, of these five things, I'm doing like half of one of them. I gotta get my game up. But I realized the message of peace of Medjugorje is something that I'm lacking at times, that holds me back, that I'm angry at times, I don't forgive my kids at times, and that blocks me from understanding who they are. And when I'm able to forgive, them or myself, I have an open heart and I can listen more. And when I can listen better, I can hear who they are, what they're saying, and I can affirm others in my family, my wife, or in the workplace, the way less affirmed me. And I have this new found energy to affirm others now, the way less affirmed me. I want to affirm others and see God in others and let them know about it because I believe that will change the world. I want to bring that peace of Medjugorje in the world we're in today. And that's my mission here as I stand in front of you. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. <laughs> Can't be too close to them. <laughs> well, thank you, Dan, for, for that. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to um, ask Dan about his presentation? As part of our Q&A session? Yeah, right John. there. We can yell from here. Okay. Um, so for someone who is looking for a mentor in their industry, it's, I'm assuming it's not as straightforward as like walking up to your boss and saying, hey, can you be my mentor? How do you start those conversations? Like, what is the, is it going out to lunch and just discussing that, or what, what would you advise? So how do you find a mentor in the workplace? Well, YCP is a mentoring program, so you can look that up, yeah. Uh, they'll set you up somewhere. Uh, but I think it's really observing who in the workplace that you admire, who do you want to emulate, and try to connect with them. 
and just go right to, you know, I don't know your organization and how it works, but it's okay to have mentors that aren't part of your reporting line or work outside or whatever that are somehow related to your company. And you can have mentors outside of your company as well. But I would break the rules of like, you know, you can only work in this one group and go out and seek people who you admire and you want to emulate. Good question. Yes. I think you gave a good example with uh, the old boss class about how to be a great mentor. Um, but can you flip it around? Like, what are some things that good mentors don't do? What are some things that good mentors don't do or good protégés don't do? <laughs> what are some good things? Oh, that good mentors don't do. Well, tell you what to do, like do this or do that. They want to enable you what to do. So good mentors shouldn't be just telling you the answer. Um, and they really are a good sounding board. They want to, you need to hear what you're saying to them reflected back so that they understand. So you may hear some complex scenario of what a mentor is telling you to do and it's like, that's not anybody even I'm talking about. So a good mentor will speak your language, so to speak, um, your dialogue, and won't be coming up with something too complex that you don't understand. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Yes, back there. Uh, have you mentored anyone? And if so, how is that experience for you? I'm sorry, what is that? Have you mentored anybody before? And if so, how is the experience for you? Have I mentored anyone before and what's that experience? Yes, I have mentored others before. Uh, sometimes it's a wonderful experience of people that move up in your organization. Uh, they also may make partner. They may move on to another firm. And it's just, it's great to see how their life has changed. There's also people I've mentored that have taken another path or get angry that they don't get promoted and they really turn away. And that's sad and that's disappointing and that can be frustrating and make you angry. But you gotta let that go, that's their issue, not yours. So you do take risk spending time with others and not all of them are successful. Um, but it's, uh, it's very rewarding when you see others grow and develop. And then you see them implement some of the good things you were doing and they tell you, well, you used to do this and don't do that. You know, they give you, f it's good when you get feedback from your protégés. Yes, one in the back. What would, what advice would you give to your younger self? Like if you were 20 in your 30s, what would you give? What, what advice would I give to my younger self? Less donuts. <laughs> Less beer. And start lifting weights at age 30, not at age 49. That's, other than that, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. no. Yes. That's so small. Right now. This is what you're doing. Somebody looking at boss talking about that here. Do you wish to have the accounts able or accounts receivable set up before they apply for an RSE? Again, a technical accounting question. That's not for me. I'm the partner and I sell work and have someone else do it. So yeah, but you, you do want everything prepared. You know, you, you want it in the best form you can before the end of the year, yes. <laughs> Anyone else? And I'll be around as well if there's any other questions. There you go. All right. <laughs> yeah, let's give Dan a round of applause. So Danza, thank you for joining us. We actually have a little gift for you. Um, it's a statue of St. Joseph the Worker. Oh, nice. Uh, from, from our YCB Detroit chapter. Uh, so, so we really appreciate you, uh, you coming up and joining us. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now hand the microphone over to Katie, um, who is our membership director, uh, to give us some final thoughts. So again, thank you, Dan, so much for sharing your time with us tonight and the lessons you've learned. We have all really appreciated it, and thank goodness the rain uh, stopped coming down. Uh, we'd also like to thank our sponsors, Alliance Catholic Credit Union and Penske, for help making events like this possible. Um, as there's a group of people going around right now, we want to hear from you. Um, we are actively working on making these events better for our attendees. So we would ask if you would take a couple minutes to take a survey. You can scan the QR code um, and just give us your feedback. It should be pretty quick. Uh, lightweight survey, don't worry. Um, but it helps us build better events and a better experience for you in the future. So I'll give you a couple minutes to get started on that.
So as you work on that survey, um, I'd like to just talk about membership for a minute. Um, one of the things Dan talked about was the value of having a really great mentor. Um, one of the perks of YCP's membership program is that we can help connect you with a mentor who can be both in your field and is Catholic on top of it. And we now have access to a nationwide platform, so your mentor does not necessarily have to live in Detroit. You have a lot more options that stretch beyond that, and they can help you grow in various ways, including how to be a better Catholic professional, but also helping you identify career paths going forward. Um, a couple other things we have to offer that come through the national part of membership include YCP forums. Uh, this is a new program where it's really building a group of young professionals in the same stage that you are and using it as peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and an accountability group um, as you move through your day-to-day -day life at work. So it's really growing together and using your peers as someone to help guide you. In addition to that, there's also a spiritual hotline, there's a career coach, there's a life coach. So if anything related to that sounds exciting to you, please come find me after. But in addition to that, we've also been working on revamping our exclusive YCP Detroit member perks. Um, one of those things is going to include a welcome package that may or may not have a mug in addition to some other goodies um, that will come when you join YCP membership. And we're working on developing a handful of member perk events next year, um, one of which may include a baseball game where members get to go for free. Um, so in addition to professional and social events like this, you also get the bonus add-ons of some pretty cool swag and some additional events for free going forward. So again, if you have any questions about it, please find me after. If you're currently a member and you don't know how to use your member perks, please come find me after. Um, I'd be happy to help get you connected. So I will hand it back to Trey here for a couple more remarks. All right. Thank you, Katie. So yeah, like, like she said, we're really working on you know providing a value for our members. Um, and I know she, she kind of hinted to it, but she is true on the baseball game. So actually we're announcing it for the first time right now um, some of you may have seen the flyers but july 20th um, ycp is going to a tigers game so um, if, if you are a member it is absolutely free the tickets are free but if you are a non-member that the cost is 25 dollars a ticket um, that will include admission to the game as well as a picnic uh, dinner uh, kind of a, a hot dog beans and chips and pepsi and you know the the hot dog type dinner that that the tigers will will give so um, members are free if you're a member of YCP um, and twenty five dollars per ticket if you if for non-members um, so in addition to that we're always looking for YCP uh, team leaders so if you feel called to maybe volunteer with YCP um, feel free to come talk to me or talk to a leader uh, about that um, Again, make sure that uh, when you walked in, if you don't have a name badge, make sure you signed in. Um, let us know you were here. Maybe we can follow up with you, uh, whatever the case may be. And the last thing that I want to mention is many of you over the last couple events have been asking, when are we returning to this happy hour? You know, post-COVID, we used to have these happy hours after the ESS. Well, that is happening tonight. We are going to return to our post-COVID, or not our, well, post-COVID, but <laughs> return to our happy hours after our ESS. So we're all going to go over to the Whiskey Six. Um, it's just a couple miles up the road, six minutes away, and we are going to return to our, uh, our post-ESS happy hour. So feel free to come join us for a beer, um, and we'll, we'll continue our networking there. Um, and as all, we always do with all of our YCP events, we don't have the cards today, so if you know it, uh, please go ahead and feel free and follow along with me, but we'll end with our St. Joseph the Worker uh, YCP prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. St. Joseph, by the work of your hands and the sweat of your brow, you supported Jesus and Mary and had the Son of God as your fellow worker. Teach me to work as you did, with patience and perseverance, for God and for those whom God has given me to support. Teach me to see in my fellow workers the Christ who desires to be in them, that I may always be charitable and forbearing towards all. Grant me to look upon work with the eyes of faith, so that I shall recognize in, in my share in God's own creative activity and in Christ's work of our redemption, and so take pride in it. When it is pleasant and productive, remind me to give thanks to God for it, and when it is burdensome, teach me to offer it to God in reparation for my sins and the sins of the world. Amen.
the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. This has been a great turnout. I'm glad to see so many fa new faces returning and many new, fa new faces to YCP in general. Um, and we hope to see you over at the Whiskey Six for a little post-ESS happy hour. <laughs>